you interviewed me well last year. I'm glad I'm back. And either you set me up for this, because the first speakers were doing prevention, and then Francis was talking about some of the same pathways we destroy with chemo. And if we had time, I'd tell you we're making autism as some of our late effects. So I'm having a great time, and hopefully I will add to the mix now. When we talked last year, we talked about numbers, and that's what we were talking about this morning. You heard it. Cancer is about 12 billion, 12 million patients a year in the, in the world. It's about a trillion dollars in cost. Um, despite prevention from John, and I live in Princeton, so I'm going to start using the store more and get healthy. Um, there are things we can't always prevent. I'll remind you that every day you make and break 500 billion cells. And yes, biomechanics are getting good machines, but we're turning over half a trillion cells every day, and we talked about those half billion, three billion bases in the genome. Every once in a while, mother makes a mistake. And so we need oncologists. Sadly, I don't think I'm going to be out of business for a while. Um, and before I get into the group that I want to talk about, which is an extension of this pediatric group growing into adults, um, I want to remind you where I've been so you can understand where my emotions may be. For 35 years now, I've been taking care of kids with cancer. We still lose 20%. And as we've heard some of the surgeons talk, I don't know how, and I never get used to the fact that I have to tell a parent they're going to outlive their child. It's not supposed to happen in this world. We're talking about things living 200 years. That's a tragedy, and I'm trying to put myself out of business. The group I want to focus on now in this group is exactly where Francis kind of left off, the teenagers. And here are some statistics. One in every 168 Americans develops invasive cancer between the ages of 15 and 30. Cancer kills more 20 to 30-year-olds than any other disease except depression-induced suicide. And in the teenagers, actually, drunk drivers kill more kids than cancer. But you know, it's not a numbers game. Whether you're one in a thousand or one in five, it's your child. In girls, cancer, because breast cancer starts peaking in, outranks all other disease killers by a very wide margin because we don't have the heart disease yet. We don't have the old age disease. This number translates to 70,000 15 to 40-year-olds in the United States each year. So there's a million and a half patients. And you think about cancer is mostly in old age, and it is. The mean age of lymphomas in some of these diseases I, we deal with is 70, 75. We have 70,000 people in their prime diagnosed with cancer each year. In the 35 years, and that's an important number I've been doing this, we've made great progress. When I started taking care of kids with leukemia in 1975, only 25, 30% were alive, and now we're curing about 80% with a pretty good quality. But this group is really kind of a valley of death. It's a, it's, it's a big chasm. So let's look at what's happened since 1975. I have very simple graphs. This is the annual estimated percent of improvement. So you can see in the 10-year-olds, over the last 30 years, we've improved almost 2% per year. Even in the old people, where we know how to treat them better, we've been improving at 2% per year. Look at the 15 to 30-year-olds. 0% improvement in the last two and a half, three decades. There's a great chasm there. Why? And Francis talked about it a little bit. You all, we all were 15 to 41. Some of us are. I still have a teenager. You think you're immortal. You think you're invisible. You are trying to get independent from your family. You're non-compliant. You're underinsured. You don't get the usual cancers. The cancers we see in this age group are leukemia, lymphomas, brain tumors, and germ cell tumors. Those are still pediatric diseases. The adult guys don't think about it much. And the diagnosis is usually late. So I think that, at least in part, explains this chasm. We have to fix it by educating both the primary docs and we have to get the kids in earlier. The why are simple. I've already implied that the patient is nearly impossible because of all the reasons we just heard from the neurologist. But I think the other point is, who is treating these patients? If I'm the tallest living Cayman, I think my brother's here and he'll admit I'm a quarter inch bigger than him, <laughs> at least when I wear my shoes with heels. But the real question is, what do you do with the 16-year-old who's, in fact, 190 pounds playing football, is six foot three? Do they want to see a pediatrician? 
they go to an internist. Internists treat 17-year-olds like they treat 60-year-olds. Physiologically, that's wrong. Let me show you some data to back that up. You don't have to be much of a statistician. That's estimated probability. The chances of being alive if treated with leukemia between the ages of 15 and 20 when treated at a pediatric institution is 50%. Treated by competent physicians at leading medical schools, this is Harvard, I don't want to pick on them, is in fact only about 25%. And I just don't have to pick on Harvard because my friends are here. I'm delighted there's a bunch of pediatricians. Here's an international trial between the ages of eight, uh, years 88 to 2001, the United States, Dutch, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. When the kids were treated by pediatricians, the five-year survival rate, 63 versus 34, you can read it faster. Kids do better and young adults do better when they're treated by pediatricians. Can ask again, why or how? They're kind of related questions. And the how is, how are they treated? Well, when you have a rare disease, 70,000 seems like a big number. Remember, there's a million and a half, but if only 2% of the kids get on a trial, and I promise you, by all that I believe, it's clinical trials and it's organized research, because two anecdotes don't make a fact. We need to do trials. That's how you cure people. That's how we've made progress. But if you only have 2% of 70,000, that's 1,400, and across 10 diseases, we're talking about 140 kids a year in this age group get on trials. You can't make progress. The three or four percent with the adults, it's okay when the denominator is a million and a half. You can make progress. But look, 50 percent of kids are treated on national trials. That's why we've made progress. We all work together to look at rare diseases. And we've learned that people are different. We've learned that the diseases are different. So this valley of getting accrued goes very much well with the lack of success. Even if they get on trial, and I've talked to Richard and, and Mark, I wanted to point out that in pediatrics, we do things that the adults don't do. I'm going to introduce you to some principles of chemo and a new word that came into the lexicon only about 10 years ago. So it's, it's easy to try to dialogue. You're, you're a word master. You've written about 80 books now. So the definitions, classical chemotherapy, the ability to kill. People have said, well, you can use gasoline. I'll submit to you there is no cancer cell I can't kill because I have a blowtorch and it gets to 2,000 degrees, but I don't treat disease. I treat people, and we have a problem with that. So all of our classic chemotherapy came from animal models and killing cells in a bottle, and it was called dose-limiting toxicity and maximally tolerated dose. And since I'm among friends, that's basically saying these are empirically derived. How much can I give without killing the patient? And I'll repeat it on every three to five week cycles. We've made progress. We win with some of this. But the new knowledge makes us realize that tumors are heterogeneous. The cells that we learned to kill in a bottle were all lined up waiting for us to kill. They're not all lined up waiting for us in the body. They hide the stem cells. Some are dividing, some are not. So in fact, the tumor is heterogeneous. So in the year 2000, in fact, on April Fool's Day 2000, four papers were published, one out of Harvard and one out of uh, Toronto. And I got into the mix, because I'll show you why, because I took offense that we made up a new word for describing something we've been doing for almost 40 years. It's called metronomic dosing. And it says, I'm going to give a low, constant dose. You don't take all your antibiotics in one day. You don't take a month's of blood pressure medicine on one day unless it's a time release. It may be that since tumors are heterogeneous, we would win by finding the smallest dose that works and leaving it there. So when you look at how much you can give chemo, it's either how much or how often. And some of us now believe that more often is more important than simply a higher dose. And in fact, in pediatrics, when this word was coined in 2000, I didn't think there was anything new. The words, the synonyms are continuation therapy or maintenance therapy. And I want to show you some data. This is the timeline of curing children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I've been professionally involved since about 1970 or so. And there, the EFS, that's a euphemism for event-free survival. This is the slide I actually use with the medical students. So you can see the ability to live five years with the garden variety leukemia in 2000 is 80%. As of about 2005, with an experimental protocol and 400 kids, we're up to, in our, my old place, we're up to about 88%. What's remarkable here 
are those drugs. You don't, I don't care that you don't know vincristin and prednisone, those drugs. Every drug I'm using today was available in 1960. We've added nothing to the armamentarium. But the methotrexate is four times a day, sometimes once a week. The 6 mecaptopurine is every day, twice a day for three years two and a half to three years, depending on the protocol. The prednisone is an oral pill. The asparaginase is a long half-life. We would give it in every other week for a year. The fact is, what the adults were calling metronomics is really what's maintenance. We've been doing it, and it works, and it's outpatient. And oh, by the way, it's less expensive. So in fact, next time somebody talks to you about metronomics, remind them that we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, what we have been doing is applying new information because, in fact, the disease is heterogeneous and the kids are heterogeneous. So old drugs, using better, just learning who's going to relapse and who's going to not. Are the adults catching on? Well, I'll give you an example. CHOP stands for four drugs, cyclophosphamide, hydroxydone, arubicin, oncovin, and prednisone. Um, it's the mainstay for adults and kids with lymphoma. If you talk to any medical oncologist with the usual kind of B cell lymphoma, they'll tell you that this combination's been around for several decades. And at about the two year mark, about half the patients is still doing well on the adults. But this is where dialogue's important. So there's CHOP. They give vincristin on day one, prednisone for five days. The other two drugs, they give the same on one day. I didn't bother to highlight them. And then they repeat it every 21 days. So in 42 days, you get three days of vincristin and 10 days of steroids. As published in the New England Journal by people at Stanford and our whole entire pop pediatric group and Harvard, um, CHOP in pediatrics is weekly than Kristen for seven weeks. So we've given seven doses in 42 days, not three. We've given 28 days of steroids instead of five. We're 90% at 10 years, not 50% at two to three years. So. I would submit that the 19-year-old better get treated on our CHOP, and in fact, I've been doing that and working with my adult colleagues. We've been challenging them to do nothing but use what we use in pediatrics. We learn it. They might have to drop the dose a little bit, but an ounce a day for 30 days may be better than 30 ounces in one day. Any pharmacologist in the room will know it's not even close to the same therapy. So all CHOP is an equal. Are the adults learning? Because I'll say anybody now with pediatrics is anybody younger than me, and I think the only person older than me is you. We are making progress. So here's, this was just published last month. I love the title. The Italians, the Europeans now are actually way ahead of the United States groups. Metronomic chemotherapy for metastatic prostate cancer, a young concept for old patients. They're taking $3 pills of cyclophosphamide and little bits of Celebrex, because it's anti-inflammatory, it's anti-tumorigenic, it's anti-endothelial, and we're getting huge mileage with very old drugs used cleverly. So metronomics is, is coming in. So you asked me on the phone, so when should a pediatrician, you used to see a pediatrician? Well, the smile answer is when you want a hug and a kiss, and you want somebody to listen to you and sit on the floor with you. I think the real answer is whenever the disease is well known to the pediatrician, regardless of the age of the patient, we don't have such volume as adult oncology, a metric for you. The average medical oncologist will see 400 new patients a year. They don't work 365 days a year. The average medical oncologist will see 100 patients a week new in his clinic, uh, return. You can't get the time you need. Medicine is a service. I'm an ombudsman. When they're turning it into a business, they're making it very hard for us to do medicine and counsel people and talk with people. So you need to see a pediatrician whenever you need the time to talk to somebody. On a slightly more serious note here, I'm putting up a couple of websites, because last night, as you said, it's much more fun to probably talk around outside. Lenny here? Lenny Sender, you here someplace? Lenny is at Children's Hospital of Orange County, University of Irvine. And he's been making some progress. So this, what I've been talking about seriously now with this in-between kids, the NCI is now calling it AYA, Adolescents and Young Adults, this great chasm. And there is a new group that Lenny's been part of. It's called cancercharter.org. And since it was 70,000 patients, 70k.org, there is a big push to make sure that this 15 to 30-something gets all the care they need, even if they don't want it. 
And I could finish with a quote from Osler who said, medicine means you got to do to people what they don't even know they need. And he said that about 200 years ago, well, 150 years ago. And then finally, um, if you really want to read more about metronomics, because it's been a passion of mine now for 25 years, and even though the word's only been around, um, a couple of friends of mine started a metronomic group, and you can pick that up there. And I thank you very much for listening again and hearing about cancer and problems in young adults.